Greetings, this is Pastor Steve Snyder from First Assembly of God in Clear Lake, California. And you're about to see a video of one of our services. And I pray that the preaching of God's word will touch your heart. Usually it's a service from the week before, but it's a word that will bless you. So I pray God's blessing in your life as you feast on God's word. Today, I got a message for you that's very, very simple, yet absolutely profound, how it will change your life if you can get this. We're going to talk about how do I relate to God. There are so many different opinions on this all around the planet of how you relate to God. If you're a Muslim, you relate to God, to Allah, way differently than we relate to the Lord. It's more out of fear. It's not a personal relationship that they would consider that blasphemy, that you could actually have a personal relationship. If you went over to, Hin to, uh, to India and, and you became a Hindu, you, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of gods. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> and how they relate to them in different ways. You, you go to different places and you find that. But even more amazing is that within Christianity, you find different ways that people relate to God. A lot of Christians relate to him out of a, a way of fear. that They look to God as fire insurance. That, you know, if they just try to keep a good thought and try to do the right thing, and, and then God will smile at them and won't punish them with hell. Then you've got other people that, that look at relating to God only in what God does for them here with no real thought about eternity. Then you have those people that are worshipers, that love God with all their heart, and, and they, they have this intimate relationship with Him. So much that wherever you go, they're acknowledging Him. They're thinking about the Lord. They, they can hear the Lord talk to them. It's not an unusual thing. When the Lord talks to them, Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. Amen. So many different ways to relate to God. Here we, we understand that God, who he is, and, and because we simply just read his word and take his word for it. We know that he's creator of all things. We know that He is our Heavenly Father. Just as He would call us to be a father and have that love for our children, He is our Heavenly Father with a love for us. We know Him as the Son of God, Yeshua in the Hebrew, Jesus in English, the Savior. He is the Christ, the, the Mashiach or the, the Anointed One, the One who, who was sent to do something for us, to save us from our sins. We understand that, and, and can relate to him as the Spirit of God, called the Holy Spirit. He is holy, and that means he's 100% good. We know that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Omniscient. He's all-knowing. You, you can't surprise God. You know, you, you came to the, Lord, to the altar, you received Him, and then you, five years later, you, you, you turned away from Him. He knew that when you came to the altar. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's ever-present. Wherever you go, you think God's over there and you're running over here, guess what? You're running right into Him. He's everywhere. You cannot 
escape his presence. God is perfect in all of his ways. How do you relate to this perfect God? We know he is so holy that he stands for all that is good while inviting us, his people, to follow him because his way is perfect. So much more than just the little love. You know, there's more songs written about love than anything else. Secular, Christian. You know, I love pizza. If it's done right. Nothing worse than a pizza is not done right. See, that's not, I don't have unconditional love for pizza. See, God is perfect. How do we relate to a perfect God when we're so imperfect? God's word directly tells us we come to the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. You cannot do it some other way. You can't invent another religion. You cannot think you're smart and you can figure out a better way. There's only one way to God, to God, and that's His way. Everything else is not His way and just won't work. We have to humble ourselves. Believing and receiving what Jesus did for us on the cross. We have to acknowledge that, that we are sinners, that, that we have... We've done things, many who have, we've all done things we're ashamed of. We're all, we've all done things we don't want to broadcast it all over the world. Thanks to Facebook and everything else, that's being done. <laughs> Sometimes we do it ourselves. But we need to go to our Heavenly Father with the love that He first loved us with. Since God is love, we need to meet him right at the place of his love. That's where we meet him. We don't meet him in, in, in the fear thing. You know, the word fear, when it talks about the fear of the Lord, it, it talk, it's more of a reverential thing. It's an understanding how awesome and powerful he is. And respect that. It's respect. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It gives us the power to be able to love, to be able to have a sound mind. That's why it's listed in those, those ways. We need to relate to him with the love of Jesus who gave himself for us. And how do we do that? Well, we come to God his way according to what we hear in his word. The first scripture we're going to give to you is 1 John 4.19. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. We didn't impress him by good behavior. We didn't impress him by all the things that we've done that's right. All the things that we've done wrong is why Jesus came to die on the cross. We love him because he first loved us. Even when we don't even love ourselves sometimes because of what we do. We relate to God personally through the faith that comes from reading His Word. Jesus Himself gave these words in John 3, 16. Oh, I know that scripture. Do you really? Do you think you'll ever totally know that scripture? I don't think so. The mind of God is pretty huge. For God so loved the world. The first six words. For God so loved the world. He loved us. Not he was ticked off at us. 
He loved us. This is the, these are the words of Jesus, who knows personally about the Father. For God, talking about His Father, so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Begotten means, uh, if you read the begats in the Bible, it's human. He, there was a point in time when, when He became human. He existed always. He is God. He existed as God. He, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one. He gave us His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish. That meant you were going to perish unless you believed in Him. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow. In other words, God so loved the world that He gave us Jesus. He gave you Jesus, every one of you. How much does the Father love Jesus? How much does he love you giving Jesus to you? The great commandments, Jesus said, the greatest of them all, love God with all your heart, your soul, with all your might, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor who was made in the image and likeness of God. The very essence of God is love. So it's, makes sense to understand what God's love really is and how His love differs from what we normally call love in this fallen world, like our love for pizza. God's love is a whole other dimension. The Hebrew language has 11 or 12 actual different words that they use for love. There's two of them that are used in the, in the Bible and the main one that's most important is the agape love, which is unconditional love. Not I love you because you are nice to me, but I just love you. It's that unconditional love that God loves us with. And to understand how his love differs is to understand that just that very first part of that scripture, for God so loved the world he gave. The, the way of God's love is always giving. It's selfless. It's giving. Love is giving at the expense of yourself. Lust is taking at the expense of others. It would be lust that would cause a person to steal from somebody or for a man to abuse a woman. That's lust. Selfishness. I don't care what it does to you. That's the opposite of God's love. God's love is so great, He became a human being to die for us. That's great love. In His love, He gives perfect affection to us. And He assigns a value upon us that's perfect. God is perfect. His love is perfect. His affection for you is perfect. His value for you is perfect. You could say, God so valued the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If you knew, if you, you came upon a rare coin, there's only three in circulation, and this coin is worth $5 million, and they were selling it for $500, you would do everything you could to get that money. If you didn't have it, you'd try to sell everything you could to get that because of the value of it. God so valued us. So it, it involves giving, affection, and value. This is God's kind of love. Some of my recent messages that I've given were to encourage each of us to grow closer to God. I talked about the providence of God. The providence of God means God is involved with the creation. I mean, I mean that, you know, he's not aloof. We taught the difference between believing in God as the, provinci as the providence of God versus deism. Deism believes God created everything. But deism believes God created, set it in motion like an automatic clock that's ticking away and then is gone. And so your prayers mean nothing. 
because it's just going to be what it's going to be. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, what will be, will be. Where providence, you talk about the providence of God, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Jesus made that very clear, that God is involved in our lives. And we talked about repentance, turning to God. Why? Because none of us are perfect. We need God's correction when we're going the wrong way. We need to seek God's way, understanding it's the best way because it's the way of His love. Maybe not temporarily. Maybe we can't see it right at the moment, but He's working all things together for good for those who love Him, called according to His purpose. Didn't say for everybody. You see, how can He work good when, how can He bless you into doing more evil? Can't do it. Talked about how sin, it's, it's come, you know, the English word sin comes from an archery term meaning you're, you're trying to hit the bullseye and you miss it. You miss the mark. Sin is missing the mark of God's perfection. And, and God is saying, okay, I, I, want to, I want to change that because your sin is robbing you of that close relationship with God. It's just part of us. When, we do, when we're naughty, we don't want to sit there and start praising God and praying. We want to be more like Adam and Eve and go hide. We need something to cover us. I'm ashamed, God. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. And, and it's okay to have that. It's okay to be repentant. But he doesn't want you walking in condemnation because his word says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. God has truthfully de declared this fact. Now, this is my main point today. The result or consequence of sin is death. Where we're saying death is the result of sin, the consequence of sin, not the punishment for sin. We've got to separate those two because if you think God is the big punisher, up above, ready to swat you every time you do something wrong, you'll never have a loving relationship. How could you love somebody that just wants to punish you all the time? God gave us choice. That means there's more than one thing to choose from. That means we can choose good or we can choose evil. But he does not want to punish you. We'll put it this way. Death is a consequence of sin that turns away from God's life. In the same manner of comparing here now, okay? Death is the consequence of jumping off a 500-foot cliff, not a punishment. You jump off a cliff 500 feet, you die. You can't say, oh, God was punishing me. No, it was the consequence of walking off the cliff. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. Death is the consequence of sin. It's not mean old God punishing you. It's reaping what we sow, meaning we have choice. Now, when you understand that, you can understand that even if you mess up, God still loves you, but he doesn't want you going off the cliff. He loves you so much, he says, no, follow me, follow me. Don't do that. You have the free will, you can. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, not because they were going to crucify him, but because they were missing his love. When you understand God's love this way, that the consequence of sin is death, not a mean God wanting to punish you. He set it in motion. You turn away from life, you have death. And you see that? That's the result. You see it all in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. But see, we're understanding now how God's love works. 
So how do I relate to God? That's what we're asking today. In love. That's how. In God's love. We love him because he first loved us. We love him, meaning we love his ways. We love his word. We love showing our affection for him during worship. There's a joy. There's that affection that's saying, yes, I love you, Lord. We love trusting him with our prayers. I cast all my care upon you because you love me. You care for me. See, we got to get the truth about who God is and who we are and this love thing. We've so changed it in our culture that we don't even understand God's love for us. He's not mad at us all the time. He would get angry at the fact that People try to pull you away from God because of what it does for you, just like you would for your, for your children. You know, if, if you know somebody that's not doing things right, just the, the best way to pray for them that I know is I say, Lord, I pray that you win in their life and not the devil. Amen. You win. If somebody's being ugly and being mean and being all this stuff, the devil's... Winning in their lives. To some degree, we lose. We misunderstand what God's love really is. I'm going to show you two scriptures. I'm going to put them right after each other. I'm going to show you what an apparent contradiction of God's word is about love. That if you don't really understand his love, what it really means, that it's different from loving pizza... It will trip you up. I used to look at these two scriptures, and for a while, I, I was, God, I hate to say it, but uh, you have a contradiction in your word. I don't approve of this, Lord. You know how far that goes. I'm going to compare the two scriptures. Let's go to 1 John 2.15. This is a command. Do not love the world. Everyone say that. Do not love the world. Or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm, okay. God's word says don't love the world. I want to show you a contradiction. Unless you understand that it's not. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. you got to read the rest of the story here. God so loved the world, what did he do? That he gave his only begotten son. He so loved the world to do something about it. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. When it says, don't love the world, we're told, don't go along with the world and not care about correcting it, but just be part of it. That's what it means. When it says God so loved the world, it means he wanted to do something about it. In fact, he sent his son to change the world, which he did in just three and a half years of ministry. So loving the world. We, we sing that song, loving the world, hating the dark. And you would go, oh, 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 oh. See, the scripture says, do not love the world. See, that song, we should sing that song. <laughs> and they say, I'm oh, sorry, but God so loved the world that he did something about it. You see, this is a way we look at sin. It's a, the consequence of its death. The consequence of not coming to Jesus is hell. There's no way around it. 
the consequence of receiving Jesus is eternal life. It's called choice. In order to have choice to be real, you have to get what you chose. Otherwise, it was rigged. Everybody goes to heaven or everybody goes to hell. No, it's a choice. You see, God's love includes correction to keep us from the consequence of sin. It keeps us from hurting ourselves, hurting others. You know, a lot of times we sin, not only does it hurt us, it hurts others. It hurts those that love us. It hurts God. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He wanted so much as a hen gathers his chicks to love them, but they rejected him. They had been rejecting him for over 1,500 years. And here now the Messiah finally came, and his people were rejecting him. But he already knew that would happen. And so he worked it out in a way that he could give his life for us. Perfect justice settled, completed. God's perfect mercy being given to us. God so loved the world, he wanted to help it. Not say, yeah, everybody go do what they're doing. That's what that scripture talks about. Do not love the world. Do not love it so much you want to become part of the thing that's turned away from God. But do something about it. Spread the gospel. Be a light in that darkness. That's understanding love. When God tells us something's wrong, it's because of his love. Not because he wants to punish us. He wants to save us, on the other hand. The more we truly know God, the better our relationship will be with him. God is love means God is loving. Relating to him this way makes it a joy to follow him. I remember as a child in fourth grade, I had a revelation of God. God just spoke to my heart. And I had a real revelation of God and I had a calling of God on my life. I was raised at that time in the Catholic Church. And I did not read very much the Bible. I read the church doctrines instead of the Bible. And all I could get from that is the more miserable you are, the more pleasing to God you are. So I have so many sourpuss Christians walking around because they bought the lie. In his presence is fullness of joy. If you're trying to be legalistic, then you're in the flesh. And yeah, you're going to be an old sourpuss all the time. Where the spirit of God is, there is liberty, there's freedom. <sighs> I am free to live for you. What a difference. That's walking in the love of God. That's walking in the truth of God. That's walking with Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. There's an old saying that talks about the apple of our eye, meaning the pupil of our eye, where our eye is focused. In Psalm 17, verses 8 and 9, it says, Keep me as the apple of your eye. The psalmist understands that God's watching him. And, and you say, he's watching me. Okay, who, who, who? I better be careful, you know, he's going to be mad at me. No, he's watching me with loving eyes. Do you think of God that way? Now, if you're doing running from him, God gave us a conscience to say, yeah, I'm doing wrong. But it's not to condemn you, it's to have you turn around so you don't get the consequence. It's not to punish you. It's to bring you into the freedom of his love. The freedom. Be, be free from hatred. Be free from all that stuff. We see it. It's in our culture. Our 
country has turned away from God. We've made it illegal to teach the Word of God in our, to our kids. No wonder there's no love. They try to make new ways to make love. I'm going to be politically correct. I'm green. That makes me love. Most people just love the green of money instead. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me. In other words, all the stuff coming over the media, <laughs> trying to get me angry, trying to get me all down and for my deadly enemies who surround me. I've often wondered, I, I don't know, this doesn't have much to do with this except the surround me thing. Do you know the difference between the atmosphere that we have in 2021 compared to, say, 1821? Do you know in 1821, there were no television waves going through you? There were no cell phone waves going through you? No radio waves going through you? No Bluetooth waves going through you? What has that done to us? I often just wonder that. When I think about surrounding me, or no getting away from it, wherever you are with your cell phone, even if it's turned off, they know where you are. <laughs> and it's not a loving no where you are. Sin is the greatest enemy that we have because it, 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 it get, it's missing the mark of God. It's turning away from him. And the consequence of it is death. The consequence of it is not good. The idea that we can get good out of evil is, is just absolutely crazy. And, and, and everything's been flipped around in our culture now. Where good is called evil and evil is called good. Standing for for, the, for what God says is good, uh, is, is called evil. But God always has a remnant of people who will listen to his word and follow him. And we've read the end of the book, God wins. And I want to be with him. I want to walk with him. And so I'm going to ask you just to bow your head for a moment and, and agree with me in this prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer of dedication if you need to rededicate your heart, just, just let it, just agree with it. And if you've never really given your heart to Jesus, then just agree with it and say, Lord, these is, I'm in agreement with these words. So as I make this prayer, just be in an agreement, if that's what your heart is telling you to do. Lord Jesus, I turn my life to you right now. I don't want to keep going my own way. I want to go your way. I confess that you are Lord, that you are my Savior. I believe you died for every one of my sins. And as I call upon you, all my sins have been blotted out. As far as the east is from the west, you are removing my transgressions. I believe that you died on that cross and then three days later you rose again from the dead. That you conquered sin and death. You conquered the consequences of sin, that I can have not death, but eternal life with you. I believe that you are the Lord God Almighty, and it's my privilege to ask you to take the reins of my life. Lord, I repent from all of my sins, whatever it is, lust, drugs, selfishness, greed, whatever it is. I repent from that and I turn to you and ask for you to help me every day to live for you. And Father, you said if I ask in Jesus' name that you will give it to me when asking for your will. And I know that's your will is that I turn to you, that you win in my life and not the devil. And I ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Amen.